I wanted to give you a quick update on what's happening on Jay's farm and all the wonderful things that I've learned since we've met last time on this beautiful project. You remember I was following a tutorial by Katie that she's putting on her channel, game, Making Games with Katie. There's a link in the description on this video and I have come up with something like this. So last time I showed you that I can plant plants and I can harvest plants and now I've come up with a system that lets me plant small plants and then they grow over time so I'm particularly proud of that so they don't just spawn at their real size they are now uh, tiny when you spawn them and then it takes currently in the implementation that I've created here it takes 30 seconds of my real life for them to be harvestable so uh, these I believe they are they are they grown fully no they're not if they're not fully grown I can't actually harvest them so these ones are I can just go take them away again but the ones that are small if I try to harvest those all I get is a message in the left hand corner I haven't implemented anything uh, special for that yet it's just an string that gets printed and that says it's not ripe yet which is correct so these guys i can now go and harvest and you know other other little guys that i plant they are not harvestable so that's pretty cool i like that and then the other thing i've implemented is if i show you this on the larger versions of the plants if i go and cut, put a couple more here uh, they the plants are no longer static but they move so they waft around in the wind and that's just a very subtle effect that i've seen in many video games that i always loved and i had no idea how to how to make that happen and i have worked out how to do it which is awesome the internet is a beautiful thing if you know where to look so as a comparison then these guys no they also waft i think these ones they are here the the sinti guys put them in the demo level so the leaves move but the actual potato in the middle the flower thing doesn't on my potatoes both the potato and the leaves move so there's two material zones but i believe over here yeah these guys yeah i think are they cabbages I, I can't really tell artichokes maybe i don't know these are static so they don't move they're just you know that's this is what they're they're just they're just standing there whereas the corn here that has another interesting effect applied to it and the sinti guys did that so i haven't looked into how they've made that happen uh, but yeah that's got kind of a little wafty wind effect there so that's what I've also been able to make. And, uh, you know, as you can see here now, we have wafty tomato plants and wafty pepper plants and wafty potato plants. And then the third thing that I've made happen is this counter widget here so that when I collect my plants, a counter collects, uh, a counter, it gets increased to see how many I've collected and how many I've planted independently from one another. And um, there's also some cold refactoring going on under the hood. So I thought I'm going to share with you how I did that so that you get a bit of a progress report of how I'm doing on learning Unreal Engine here. Okay, so let me go and come out of here. And let's start perhaps with the counter widget. Let's do that. The widget is something that is created anywhere here. If you right click, you can go and create a user interface blueprint widget. And that is what I've done. I just uh, can't quite remember where that was. Oh yeah, maybe HUD. There we go. That's, that's it. HUD. That's what I've called my widget. HUD. And when we open that, we get to have something along the lines of... Uh, kind of canvas editor so you get to drag things from this panel into here like a text box or a, a text value field or all kinds of sliders so in my case i have a vertical box here uh, was it vertical was it horizontal i can't remember the thing that then uh, takes multiple items that will then be arranged automatically for you so planted is just a text and the number 12 is another text field so there are two text fields one just says planted and the other one says a number and it is with this number field selected the planted value i've called it if i go over here to the content there's a little box that comes up that says create binding and when you do that you get to create a kind of a code hookup for this text field very cool to do that and it just goes up and uh, comes up with this in my case the uh, collected value and the planted value the two two things that have done exactly the same way as you create a binding the two purple nodes come up and are connected by default and what that means is that the output of the text field is being grabbed and 
put straight back into the value of the text field again. And so nothing really happens there, but we now as programmers have the option to disconnect that binding and put our own code in there. And this is essentially how I'm doing that. I'm getting a reference to my game mode called farm game mode. In it, there's a variable which is called plants planted. It's an integer variable that I'm reading out and then usually what happens if I just try to connect that to the text fields input, then Unreal is just going to put an integer to text conversion node in there automatically. So that's kind of nice. And all this does really is that whenever this field feels like it needs updating, which is something that happens automatically under the hood, my variable is inserted there instead of the regular text value. That's all there's to it really. Once that's happened, all I need to then do is go and make sure the counter appears on my viewport. And that is something I've done in the level blueprint. So every level has a blueprint up here, open level blueprint. That is the only thing I'm doing in that level blueprint. In event begin play, I'm making myself that HUD widget, which requires a player controller as an input, as the owning player. And in it, I can then pick the class of the HUD widget that I'd like to add there. So mine's just called HUD. Um, any other widget will do as well, but mine, mine is the, the one that we've just seen there. And once that is created, I go and add it to my viewport. That is that. So just to prove a point, if I go and take that off, I go and run my game again. Then we'll see that there's no more counter widget. The functionality is still there, it's just no longer displayed. So for that to show up there, I just need to go and add that to the viewport. Add to viewport, perfect. And then we'll go and connect that here with the return value and then Bob's your uncle. So that's the hot widget. So, but the thing I haven't talked about is where do we get that variable from? That that increasing counter value. Where does that happen? Well, that happens in my trying to remember where that was. I think it was player. That is actually in my game mode here, farm game mode. That is a custom event that I've added here. If I could only remember where that was, that's not actually in there at all. Sorry about that. That is in my player controller. It could go anywhere, really. I believe, yes, I've put it in the player controller. And uh, this is where that happens. There's these increase counter events here. Those are two custom events. One's called add plant and one's add harvested. Probably not named great, but what they do is literally just... Um, uh, Actually, yeah, look at that. They actually go and hook into my game mode, and that's where they do that. That is how they do that. That's how I did it. It's kind of good that I'm going through this here. I thought I had put this into the player controller, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, calling these methods in the game mode. I thought that was I thought that was the case. So the variables are actually stored in the game mode. I thought that was the case. I believe I've done that because I couldn't get a reference to the player controller from another object or I wanted to make sure it is saved somewhere. That's how I did that then. Ha, <laughs> perfect. Uh, glad I'm talking through this. So in the game mode, there's these two things, add planted and add harvested. And all they really do is take the variable that's in there. So plants planted and plants harvested, harvested. Those are two integer variables. I'm getting that, I'm adding one to it, and then I'm setting that increased value. So this is a C and kind of PHP. Most of these programming languages, they have this construct that says variable plus plus, and that means increase the value of the variable by one. Integers can do that. And you can usually, uh, then it usually means you save yourself some typing. So rather than saying i equals i plus one, you say i plus plus. It's the same thing. So that's why it says plus plus. So you get the value, you add one to the value, and then you set the value again, thereby increasing it. And every time that happens, our counter gets updated in the HUD. So that magically happens in the blueprint widget there, which is kind of cool. Yeah, so that happens in the game mode, and this custom event is actually called from the player controller as soon as, you know, I want to do something like um, add that plant there.
Player controller has a lot of code in it already. And while we're here, I wanted to show you how I've refactored some of the code. If you remember what I showed you last time, how I'm planting a plant. There's actually something that I've done there. I, I thought it is very cumbersome in my harvesting plant routine to ask which of the, which which um, plant is it that I'm currently harvesting. So I've rather than have three separate objects, I'm having one object that is a generic plant object that has the growth routine in it. And it then its static mesh is then overridden as soon as I instantiate a potato, a tomato, or a pepper. So therefore, I can just ask in the harvesting routine. Maybe we'll just start there. Actually, don't want to confuse you too much, but um, the mad professor's brain, of course. So this is the harvestable plant routine where I'm destroying the plants. So this is an event that is set up whenever I press the X button or a button on the game controller. I'm casting my i'm grabbing a reference to my tutorial pawn here that is my my player pawn and in its capsule component i'm asking am i overlapping with something that could potentially be a plant these are all the things that i'm overlapping with all the objects i'm casting that to a plant object which is great i'm doing this let's have two paths that are going on here i'm casting this to a plant object then i'm asking the plant object hey are you ripe and if that is the case and it is also uh, a plant object as such then i go ahead and destroy the actor otherwise i'm just hooking it up to a print string that says if it's if it's not ripe yet then go and say it's not ripe yet just put that on the screen there and then the, the actor is destroyed, the plant's destroyed, and I'm also adding this value here. This is what I'm calling add harvested so that the counter gets increased. But yes, let's go through this one more time on the bottom uh, loop here. So I'm getting all the overlapping objects, and down here on the second row, I'm saying get the class of the object that I'm overlapping with. So it could literally be anything. I'm getting the class of that object. And then I'm saying, is this class a child of? And I'm saying a plant object here. And a plant object is a class that I've created. That's the generic plant that has the growth routine. But as soon as a potato or tomato or pepper or any other plant is instantiated, it then overrides the static mesh. So therefore, I technically only have one plant object. I don't have to ask here, is it this, is it that, or is it that? I'm just saying, is it this class? And if it's a child of that class, great. In that case, we're okay let's get rid of it but if it's not if it's a, if it's a different thing it's like i don't know a windmill or a tractor then of course you know leave that there so that's how i've saved myself some code here and i thought that was you know kind of, kind of quite proud of being able to work that out if both of these things are correct if the is ripe value is correct like is the is the fruit ripened has the animation fully grown and is it a plant that we're overlapping with then go and say if that is true then go ahead and get rid of the actor and increase the counter if it's false just tell us hey that thing's not ripe yet speaking of refactoring code there's another thing i've done here and uh, this is the kind of the old code that i'd like you to have a quick look at this is how i used to plant a tomato before i had a major code rewrite session so um, this is kind of complicated and Katie explains most of what's going on here. It's a custom input action that says plant flower. In my case, it's planting a potato. And we're getting our tutorial pawn again. And we're uh, having a look at our spawn point. Where is this thing going to be spawned? So I'm looking at the uh, ground, which is the half height of my player's capsule. I'm also looking at the forward motion of the of the arrow that I've created there last time, just so that the object isn't created underneath the player, but like in front of the player on the ground. That's not a great solution. So I need to work on that because it currently doesn't line up with the crosshair, but you know, that's, you know, for another time. So I'm getting uh, half the world location values here from my capsule and the forward motion from my arrow component. And uh, that is how I'm getting the position of where my new actor is going to be spawned in my case it's going to be a tomato here and i need to give the spawn actor the class as well as the position and then you know that's that's what happens and then we also increase the plant counter 
So that's what happens for tomato. If I were to go and plant a potato and a pepper, what I did in my previous example, I literally copied the whole thing, pasted it up here. So this is an exact duplicate of it. And the only thing I've changed then is to say spawn the actor of a pepper class. I had to do this three times and when I did it I was thinking that's really not a good way of doing it because what happens if I want to change something? I'd have to literally go and find every replica of this thing and then change whatever I want to do there and that's that's not a good way of doing it. That's not a good way of programming things. If you see repeated code that gets copied and pasted multiple times there's usually a better way to do this and the answer to the puzzle is of course to take this whole thing that gets done repeatedly and refactor that into its own kind of function. Let's just call it a function. And then I can do something like this. So in my plant potato class, I've done exactly that. I've still got the input routine that I'm questioning, but rather than execute the whole code, I'm just literally executing another custom function that takes an input in this case the input is well what do you want to plant and i'm just saying well plant a potato in this case so i can go ahead and replace my other code uh, literally with this by refactoring it and making it more generic and that's what i've done down here so this is now the whole creating a plant thing exactly what we've seen in my previous thing with the exception that this custom event here has an input parameter. That's kind of a nice concept here. I was looking for a way to get a parameter out of a custom event, but that doesn't seem to work. I could set some output as a variable that then another function queries, but there's a better way to do this, and that is by giving the custom event an input. And that's what I've done here. So I've, I've created a custom event, added a parameter here. It's technically just a variable, and the class, the, the um, type of variable in my case is the plant class. So that lets me now call this custom event and specify a parameter, namely what do I want to plant. So this does exactly the same thing as I showed you before. And the moment it gets to picking whatever thing it needs to plant, it just takes that from the input parameter and it does everything else because literally that functionality is now completely independent of the thing that actually plants the plant. So this just kind of abstractly goes ahead and does it. And my other class here, this way, when I'm when I'm saying plant a potato, all it really needs to do is that it needs to send the potato parameter. And the rest can happen in this function. And the great benefit of doing it this way is A, less confusion. There's no like same code plastered five times in the same blueprint. That's that's not a that's a non-starter. You have that once and if you want to change it, that's the second benefit. You just go ahead and change whatever needs to be changed. So in my case, I want to make sure the planting position lines up with the crosshair. So I'll go ahead and do that next time. But yes, that's what I've been able to do. And it's now abstracted. So the good thing is if we wanted to make that happen for the for the pepper then I can just go and this is the pepper routine here. I can literally go and take all of this stuff out, literally everything. And from here, input uh, input action plant pepper, I can go and say, uh, was it again? Create plant of class. There we go. That's that. That's, that's all I need to call on that custom event. And then I can say, since this is a yellow pepper, I can go and just pick my new pepper down here. I could even go ahead and uh, give read that out from something else, like a radial menu that I'm also keen to implement. So rather than having to uh, have a separate button for every plant that we're planting, I'd, I'd like ideally for this to be selectable with a menu. And this is the exciting thing on the Unreal Marketplace called uh, generic radial menus, I believe. Yes, I haven't looked into that yet, but that's that's my plan. So there we go. That's how we do that. Let's go and uh, let's quickly see if it works. That was the yellow pepper. Always good to check once you've made a change. Does it actually work? P is a pepper. There we go. And it gets planted and it just gets counted. It gets updated and everything just behaves the same, but with much, much less code duplication there. Okay, good. What else? The Yes. Oh, yes. The... Um, how does the plant actually grow? How do I make that happen? And what does the material 
look like? How does the why does this thing waft all of a sudden when in the last episode it didn't do that? How did that happen? Well, let's check the generic plant class first. I think everyone's grown up. Look at them grow. This is so cute. Now I can go and collect them. That's very cool. Excellent. So let's have a look at how I've made that happen. That is now an abstracted class. So it's a, it's a bit like um, what I've done with the code there. I've just refactored this visually. Uh, here, down here in my plants section, I now have a pepper, a tomato, and a potato. These are the old ones here, uh, potato, tomato, and yellow pepper. Those are the old versions in which I had literally created the plant like this. This is kind of the, the static uh, potato plant and it didn't really have anything in its event graph. So it doesn't it doesn't really do anything. It's just a blueprint that is its own class. And that the, the issue with that was that when it comes to harvesting them, I have to say, is it a tomato or a pepper or a potato? So I have to literally have this triple branch and that's ugly code. That's just, that's a lot of work. So what I've gone ahead and done is then to create a generic plant class. And that currently looks like a tomato. <laughs> And it already has the wafty materials on there, so I'll explain that in a moment. So it just has a regular plant thing, and it has the growth template in its event graph. And that works with a timeline. So as soon as the event begins to play, we're starting this growth routine here. And all that does is literally, it's a, it's a timeline here that I've already got open with two values with two keyframes. The first one is at time zero, we have a value of, well, technically zero. There we go. Oh no, actually I didn't, did I? Ah, oh, I did that deliberately. I didn't want that to start at zero. I wanted the plant to start at uh, not exactly invisible. I wanted it to start small. So this is the value between zero and one. So I've started with 0 0.2 and then at 30 seconds, and this is totally up to us how fast we want the plants to grow up. So in my case, I'm using 30 seconds. You can use a, a random value there, whatnot. But I'm using 30 seconds as my fully grown stage, and that value is 1. So I have a value that this timeline gives me from 0 0.2 to 1 over the course of 30 seconds, an animated value over the course of 30 seconds. So in here, I'm then updating the relative scale of my object, of my plant object here. And that is just something that I'm taking from here, from the viewport, literally the, the plant, I'm just calling it plant, that's the static mesh of the thing that goes and grows. That in the viewport is of course 100% size, and it looks like a tomato right now, but that's just a placeholder. So in the event graph, I'm animating the, the scale of this thing over the course of 30 seconds, and that's how the plant grows. I'm also doing something else. There's a, a parameter here, a variable, a boolean. In this case, it's called isRipe. It's a public boolean. And when the animation has finished playing, I'm hooking that up to set the value of the isRipe variable. So the isRipe variable is set to false when the when the thing gets created. And after 30 seconds, namely when the plant has reached its full growth stage, it is set to true. And at that point, I can check in my harvesting routine, is this parameter set? And if that's the case, we can harvest the thing. If it is not the case, then we can't harvest and a little error message pops up. So that's how the thing grows, which is awesome. Do we have anything in the construction script? No, but that'll be important as I inherit from this generic plant class and turn it into a tomato, potato, a pepper, and whatever else plant I wanna, I wanna use. So with this in mind, I've created the new pepper, new potato, new tomato classes here. Let's stick with the pepper one perhaps. And that inherits basically everything that the plant class has. So in, in, in regards to, if I wanted to make that, if I wanted to make a new class, I'll go and say, uh, I will 
create a blueprint and in it I want to inherit not from these things but from my generic plant class so and then I go and create a new blueprint from that from the thing that I've just made and that is how I ended up with something like the new pepper its viewport looks exactly the same because I'm not really touching the tomato you think you know, are you talking about a pepper this is a tomato plant well here's the thing in our event begin play and we don't actually need these two things here just to avoid confusion in my event begin play this is already hooked up to the begin play of the parent class which is nice so the unreal engine does that automatically i don't have to worry about this it goes and calls the begin play of the parent class so anything that happens there namely the whole growth routine is called on my thing as well on my new pepper class on my new pepper blueprint but i don't have to worry about it it just goes and does it because it's already inherent in the in the um, class above it in its parent all i'm doing here is i'm overriding the static mesh of plant which is this one here plant is inherited i'm setting that when the event begins to play to something else namely the um the different thing which is called the pepper plant and that is how i'm replacing the static mesh the moment this thing gets constructed or the moment this thing gets initiated that is kind of cool i could probably also do that in the construction script if i wanted to it's also hooked up to the construction script of the parent but this is kind of empty now I, i'm doing this in event begin play and that is why i don't really have to do anything else in here all the functionality is just inherited from the class above it and all i'm doing is i'm swapping out the mesh so now if i go and call now when i spawn in a potato it is taking the plant class swapping out the mesh and just grows up like all the other plants it also has the is ripe value just like the other plants the other plants that's how we do that very cool and then the third thing uh, that i do or the last thing i wanted to explain is how do i make the plants waft why do they waft why what's what's going on with that well i had always assumed that is some really really difficult geometric change that happens somehow on the mesh level but that it's actually much much simpler than that and i was really really glad when i found that out um, and there's an article on my website actually in which i'm explaining how this works this happens on the material level and um where was it the Veg Ve vegetable mat there we go that's the one that i've made just a replacement of any of the other things that Cinti have offered here so i think it was the, this one here the mac polygon farm 1a i've duplicated that and turned it into a vegetable mat and all we need to do here is to hook up a panner node to a sign node and add that to the world position offset and that has this kind of wobbly effect here which is really nice so it's very subtle i don't think i can control it much there's another way to control it I, I decided for this version but there is an article on my website that explains a second version of how you can actually control how much flutter or how much um wow and flutter literally had the the thing has but i thought what's what was interesting is that you don't have to mess with wind forces or any other kind of scary thing that i know nothing about of course so it's really easy to just add that to uh to the material here a panner node and a sign node and then add that to the world position offset and that gets that subtle waft effect and then the only other thing that we have to do is to make sure that in our generic in our kind of in our let's go to the plant uh, thing into the viewport here you need to make sure you change out the default material so what threw me off there is that this one here in, in my case it has two material zones so it has element zero and element one one's for the leaves one's for the actual tomatoes Cinti have it made so that there's literally just one large texture that they use for pretty much every object and every object is kind of uv mapped onto that texture if we have something that just has a solid color i can i suppose you can just go make a new material out of a flat color for that uh, but in my case i basically applied these two materials uh, that are both animating and that is how both the stalk here and the tomatoes and the leaves independently waft around so they have two different um, animations applied 
And that is that. As soon as you've applied that, everything that is created that is this object will be will be wafting in the viewport. There we go. That is the fruit of all my labor. Uh, I hope that was informative and helpful. The next thing I want to do is make sure that when I when I plant something, this little crosshair really should should line up with where I'm planting my plant. Right now, it just goes and plants itself whichever distance from my capsule is happening thanks to the arrow that I've explained there in the in the previous tutorial and um, yeah so that means literally when I do this it's, it's always just a half circle it is always planting on the ground but I'm literally now planting everything the same distance from me and that's just not correct for for the for the for the uh, camera distortion there so i'm hoping i'm going to have a solution for that uh, next time and also i'll be able to hopefully plant these with a radio menu there the generic radio menu from the unreal marketplace which happens to me in, in my inventory already so that's very cool so there we have it counters wafty plants class inheritance and all of that with elegant code under the hood. Well, and it's kind of getting elegant there. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a master at any of this, but it is certainly getting someone. I thought, you know, this is kind of nice how uh, a few weeks ago I knew nothing about Unreal Engine. And as I look deeper and deeper into this, it looks like we can have a little farming game that we can build here with the uh, Unreal Engine, uh, with the with the Sinti, asset, Sinti assets in Unreal Engine. I hope this was helpful. I hope you enjoyed that. And um, if you want to, there's something else I can uh, show you that you could check out if you'd like to. There's something else. I might explain that in my next video. Let me go and bring it up here. There is something that is called Jay's Awesome MVP Game. Oh, come on. Here it is. You can get it from as a free product from my coffee store. I'll put a link in the description here. That's where it is. Jay's awesome MVP game. And that is something that I've been also been able to make and build. So you can have a look at that. It also has counters and in it, Unreal Guy just wanders around and has to collect these purple objects before the time runs out. And if you don't make it, then you get a wild game over type screen. Or if you do make it, you get a congratulations screen. It has sound effects. It has interactive water which is super exciting and it has you know uh, lots of purple objects that you have to collect and it's called jay's awesome mvp game this is another tutorial i followed from uh, from the wonderful matthew watstein he has this series on his channel i'm going to link to that in the description i might tell you more about that in my next video until such time thank you so much for dropping by i hope you got at least something out of my rambling and i will see you next time take care bye bye